All right, welcome everybody. So my name is Martha Alter Hines, and I'm so happy, excited to be talking with Sheridan Simple and Kaylin Castell. And most of you are probably pretty familiar with both of them. I've interviewed both of you, I don't know, many times, <laughs> several times each, including together. Um, so yeah, this is yet another opportunity that I'm really honored and happy that we get to enjoy this, <laughs> share it with all of you listening. Um, so for any of you who don't know Sheridan and or Kaylin, they are both alchemical astrologers. Uh, is that how you phrase this term now? Alchemical astrology? Beautiful. Um, among many other things. And we're going to be get diving into many layers of how Sheridan and Kaylin both approach astrology. Uh, but I also want to just give a little background on why I asked them to be part of a conversation together in this moment in January of 2024. Um, and part of it is because I've been learning from both of them this year, this past several months. So I enrolled in the, the two Venus courses that Sheridan and Kaylin hold together. And then um, I've also been at the same time, I've been learning a lot. <laughs> I've been learning a lot from just like, you can tell probably that my ninth house is very activated right now, including my Jupiter, which happens to be in my ninth house is exceedingly um, activated right now. So, um, so I'm also, I've also been taking the star alchemy classes, two of them with Kaylin and Eric Roth in the last several months. And so I'm absorbing Sheridan and Kaylin <laughs> on many, many, many layers, um, and I'm loving it. And I, the big, the big thing that I'm really hoping we can dive into right now is to use the current, some of the current key transits coming up in the next few weeks. And the next few weeks is very powerful astrologically. And to specifically look at a couple of these key transits and how much more deep and rich it becomes when we begin to incorporate some of the layers of our relationship with the cosmos that in some forms of astrology, maybe we don't focus on so much. Um, so we're going to get into that in a second, but welcome. Thank you both so much. Be here with you, Martha. You're awesome. Well, yeah. Oh my gosh. I love spending time with you. So thank you with both of you. Mm -hmm. Ditto, Ditto. Ditto. Yeah, <laughs> all of that is mutual. <laughs> so, um, so before we started recording, we were talking about again. This is a, January twenty twenty four is a very powerful month, and twenty twenty four in general, I think, is very powerful. April twenty twenty four, maybe I would say, is the most powerful. Oh, it's an, another exceedingly powerful month. Um, but even just the next few weeks are, you know, have a lot going on, and so we had mentioned two um two transits in particular do you either of you want to begin by talking about just the basics of what is alive for you in this next few weeks and then we can go more deeply well we sure. can start yeah. with no, go the venus uh, moon conjunction that just took place yesterday at the at the time we're recording this uh, and how we track the Venus cycle through the story of the descent of Inanna into the underworld, where she's releasing and letting go of all the things that are in the way of her being her true self. And then she goes through a death process, and then she's reborn, and she reclaims healthy relationship to all those energies through each of the chakra gates when she's ascending back out of the underworld. So that's the short version of that. And so she just descended through the uh, fifth gate, or the so it's the fifth Venus moon conjunction since she rose as morning star uh, back in August. Yeah, I think it was in August or early September. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> and so and that represents the solar plexus chakra because she starts at the crown and she goes down through the chakra gates. And this was a very spectacular gate because and it was so fun to see and some people didn't get to see it because they had clouds and so um 
but we have a lot of people in our class that took a lot of great pictures, including me, <laughs> with Venus, the moon very close to Antares, the heart of the scorpion or the heart of the dragon. The Chinese saw that constellation as a dragon. And then, um, and Venus, and they were just, they were kind of like, sometimes they're closer together, sometimes they're further apart, but the moon being far out of bounds outside the boundaries of the sun. And that's something else that's going on in 2024 is we're going to have the most precise out of bounds moon, full moon rise and set in at the June solstice 2024. So that's a big event. That's something that only happens every 19 years. Um, now there's a time period that goes out of bounds for a few years before and after the exact kind of center point of that. But it's going to be the most extreme out of bounds full moon that we experience in this particular cycle. Very mm -hmm. exciting. And in um, places like Scotland, it's a place, it's a time, it's a um, where they built standing stone circles to track the moon when it, they call it the moon walks the land, when the moon walks the land, because the full moon rises up, but it never gets high in the sky. It stays right on the horizon and it walks on the land. And, um, and then there's a certain way the mountain is, and it's like this old woman of the moors or Kalia, um, mm -hmm. the moon walks along her, the, the mountain range, and then disappears into a V and then, or disappears and then comes and shows up again in a V and then disappears again. And it's right from the stone circle, they were tracking that. So that's pretty amazing. And I know we weren't planning on talking about that, but somehow I just thought of it <laughs> because mm -hmm. the moon was so far out of bounds that morning. I could see the moon was right with, um, Ann Paris. And, um, so it's way below the, um, the line of where the sun travels. And so when the, whenever the moon's outside the boundaries of the sun, it's outside the boundaries of ordinary reality. And so it's a wild card factor. It's like, things can happen. We can have new perception, new ways of seeing things. So this Venus gate also had that. It was around the solar plexus where we are learning to stand and are, are releasing everything that's in the way of us standing in our true divine power. I'm going to, with that, I'll hand it off to Sheridan. But yeah, this was like, whoa, big, big, big. That just happened. And we'll be feeling this for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, um, it really like leads into the other transit that we were talking about, right. Of like Venus, the divine feminine, that we all carry that feminine and masculine aspects, that energy, that archetypal energy within us, no matter how we identify. And Venus represents the divine feminine, right. And Mars represents the divine masculine, the divine feminine just moved into that solar plexus chakra gate, right. Of like, um, helping us, like Kaylin was saying, to like clear anything that stands in the way of our being more fully in our power. And how perfect during this month of this gate that the sun conjuncts Pluto and then moves into Aquarius and then Pluto moves into Aquarius, right? Because Pluto is so much about empowerment, right? That's the gift of Pluto in a Pluto cycle is empowerment, right? I mean, we kind of, you know, certain planets kind of get a bad rap and it's like, oh, you're going into this kind of cycle. It's going to be bad. And Pluto can get labeled that way. But like Pluto is like, oh my gosh, it's like the clearing, the transformation. I mean, it is like the alchemical planet of composting and transforming into greater empowerment and how perfect that that's happening while we're at the solar plexus chakra right working on our personal power that connection between the sun and pluto power and then collective power because this is a big cycle that lasts for you know 21 years is till Pluto moves out of Aquarius or it's 20, it's on average 20 years, but it's 20, it's 20 years for sure. And then it starts going back and forth. Like it has been doing in, in 2044. So here, so 2024, it moves in. It will, it goes back into Capricorn later this year. And then it goes back into Aquarius later this year. And so from that point forward to 2024, so 20 years for sure, it's just in Aquarius. And then it'll do a little dance back and forth uh, after that. 
so as we get um, as it gets ready to move into Pisces. Which is yeah. also a great point because it's like these things take time to shift, right? It's not like, oh, the sun Pluto conjunction on the 20th, which is a big deal because then it goes into Aquarius and then Pluto follows it all within, you know, about a 12 hour period. But it's like the sun is approaching Pluto, will be with Pluto and then is separating from Pluto. Like these things, right? They're transition times rather than like 7.07 a.m. on the 20th is the only, you know, time of this energy, right? So it's, I like that what you're talking about, the shifting back and forth because it's a, it's all a transition. And something for people to know about this Pluto-Sun conjunction is it's happening at 29 degrees and 59 minutes of Capricorn. So for those of you who might not know, there are 30 degrees in a sign. So 29 degrees is the last degree and there's 60 minutes in a degree. So 2959 is the most comprehensive last moment of having it be in Capricorn. So this is the last time the sun conjuncts um, Pluto in Capricorn until 2254 because then it'll it's you know 248 year cycle it takes uh, it'll be 230 years from now before it goes back into capricorn it went into capricorn in 2008 so that's why it's not exactly 248 years <laughs> but uh but anyway so this is a, a major moment and to have it at that precise last minute degree mm -hmm. last minute of that degree is it feels like the most comprehensive possibility of how are we seeing the shadow of the Capricorn mysteries, the sun shining the light on the shadow. Pluto also is about bringing the shadow to light. So the sun and Pluto together, working together. And as Sheridan was saying, hi, alchemy. Like, whoa. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this will not happen probably for many lifetimes again. Hmm. Yeah. I love the sacredness that you guys are talking, that I feel when you guys are describing that. Um, can I share something really interesting about the solar plexus? <laughs> my own my own solar plexus experience in the last week, actually. I wasn't conscious of the fact that the next gate for Venus was up at the solar plexus, but just in the last um, <clears throat> the last two nights... <laughs> so fascinating over let's say okay over the last two to three months I would say I've been having um this kind of strange it's like a physiological anxiety not ang anxiety in the sense of think you know a con cognitive thing I'm worried about but more like my my literally my third chakra you know my solar plexus area has been especially when I'm trying to sleep doing this sort of anxiety response thing and just two nights ago so probably right when venus was coming or the moon was coming to venus it suddenly clicked for me hey why don't you get a hot water bottle and sleep with it right here be you know behind my back right at that area and then when i turn when i would turn i'd sleep on my side right so then i would sleep with it on my back and then i would turn over and let it be on my front and it was the first time in the last two or three months that I felt my solar plexus like let go. Is that fascinating? <laughs> it's like what in the world? I mean, that's just really interesting timing to me. Um, and what also is so fascinating, and I would love to to hear a little more about you know bringing in the star component of this conjunction, because the other thing that's so fascinating in listening to you is that it was on today is Tuesday last Friday I held a, a, a gathering for some of my members and I channeled something and for the first time ever in my whole life I channeled a dragon spirit so what's going on here right it's like huh hmm and then I saw you know your your associations of this this transit with dragon i mean i would love to hear more just a little more of when we bring in all of that what you know the layers of what that means for you um 
Yeah, because it's fascinating. If we think about Antares being the heart of the scorpion or the heart of the dragon, um, and different cultures have seen it in different ways. Sometimes it's seen as a serpent, that constellation. It, to me, it totally looks like a scorpion. <laughs> But um, but the Chinese saw it as a dragon. And then in uh, Hawaii, the, the, the Hawaiians saw that constellation as Maui's fish hook. And when it rises, because it rises straight up and it looks like a fish hook. But when we see it, it kind of goes across the sky this way. So we see it as a scorpion with its tail. And um, or, you know, so it, different perspectives from around the planet will have different views of what this constellation is and how to, to connect with it. But the thing about Antares that is really fascinating is that it is a bright red star. It's one of the four royal stars of the ancients. And they used um, Aldebaran, which is exactly opposite of Antares, the eye of the bull, and Antares as a way to mark out the constellations and or the, you know, how to how to mark out the uh, what's along the zodiacal band. And so those stars are very significant um, and having been used that way. Plus Antares is near the galactic center. And in fact, the scorpion's tail or the snake's tail or you know, dragon's tail, whatever we wanted, or Maui's fish hook, um, the galactic center is right above that tail. Mm -hmm. And- so wait, would Antares, Sorry, would Antares then be near the great attractor actually? Yeah, so Antares is around 10 degrees Sagittarius and the Great Attractor is around 14. Mm -hmm, so it's, mm -hmm. it's close, yeah, definitely. So mm -hmm. and I'm gonna let Sheridan take over from here. <laughs> yeah, well, and I'll just say that that's, you know, that part of the Zodiac is right on my Neptune and my IC. And anyway, it's very prominent in my chart. <laughs> so it's really interesting that this it, was the- It's my North Node, that's my North Node. So I, you know- Antares and the Great Attractor, love them. <laughs> Same. <laughs> them a lot. Yeah, they, because they can have messages and information for us when we take the time to go and be with them. Mm. Yes, yes. And that's really, I did not know, I hadn't put that all together about the Antares being the, what you said, the heart of the dragon. And that as so as the moon and venus were meeting together in the area of where antares is i was then channeling about a, a i was channeling a dragon <laughs> and the, one of the big things that came through in this channeling was um the dragon had us basically embody ourselves as a dragon and feel all the chakras of what it would be to be the being of a dragon and in particular it was really focused on the heart and how the heart is a whole world and it can be like a whole portal to, you know, it's basically the, whatever I was channeling was saying, step two of this channeling would be to then spend time in that whole world of the, of the heart of the dragon. <laughs> so this is probably not a coincidence. This is so funny. Yeah. Wow. Okay, sure. So tuned in Martha, like I love that you weren't even aware of all of these things but it all like came to you, you know, it's like, you're just so connected into what you're doing and what you're sharing and what you're channeling. And I think that if anybody needed any evidence of how amazing Martha is, you just got it. <laughs> there you are. No, no, no shaking your head <laughs> this way. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, oh my God. That. I acknowledge that. I am that. Yes. <laughs> okay. I'll receive that. And then I'll ask you both to receive because you're also too humble <laughs> <laughs> we might all do that yes <laughs> okay but i think it's like cool that this gate is happening around that happened with antares right the heart of the scorpion and we're moving from, we move from the heart chakra into the solar plexus chakra and the moon occulted right it passed over in front of Antares as well in certain locations not everyone could see that and for me it was snowing so I didn't see any of it but it was there and happening um and so I just think it brings a real like heart-based element into that empowerment right and so much of like the scorpion, the dragon, they carry this medicine that to me is like very feminine, right? Very like being um, 
uh, empowerment around that. It's like, you know, even the tail of the scorpion, like Kaylin said, is where galactic center is, which is where the Milky Way makes its whole circle around us, right? We're within the Milky Way galaxy, so it's all around us. But the thick part is where we look into the galactic center, right? right at the tail of the scorpion. And that, just the Milky Way itself, is seen as like the Ouroboros and the snake or the dragon eating its tail. So all of that energy, that alchemy is a part of this gate, which to me is so much about that more empowerment of the feminine in a really huge, important way, right? And then we have Pluto moving into Aquarius, you know, conjunct the sun. There's just so much of that energy at this time that I feel is so essential to help bring the world back into greater balance. Everything's been so out of balance. And I feel like you know, for me, all of these transits is so much of it's like an opportunity to work with the energy, right? It's not a mandate. It's not like this thing is going to do this thing to us, right? And the more conscious we can be of the energy, right? It's like the energetic soup that we're all swimming in that's happening inside and outside, right? As above, so below. The more conscious we can be with it and work with it within ourselves, it like, contributes to the change that we want to see. And I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for that. And I think it's no coincidence that they're coming into their conjunction, the sun and Pluto at the very end of Capricorn. There's so much happening in Capricorn this month. I mean, everything is moving into Capricorn or has moved into Capricorn this month as we're starting this new year and everybody feels you know, inspired to like, what do they want to create with this year? We're coming out of the holidays. We're probably like, you know, everything is a little bit like chaotic and crazy. We've been like eating stuff. We don't normally eat and going to a lot of parties. You know, everyone feels like infused to create what they want in this new year. And I feel like all of this energy, all of this Capricorn energy, all of this empowerment energy is really supportive to help us do that as we're working into this Pluto into Aquarius, right? How are we going to hopefully lean into the empowerment of Aquarius and clean up and clear out the shadow aspects of it rather than lean further into the shadow of Aquarius over these 20 years? Exactly. And that's, that's what I've been feeling also so much is the wisdom of the way that these transits happen slowly back and forth over time. And, and something I talked about actually in a video I did on the new moon, this new moon we have coming up in Capricorn um, is, is how uh, I'm guessing you, you also see similarly, but you tell me <laughs> is that this will be the second time that Pluto will move into Aquarius Um out of a total of three times, right? And before it's really fully moving in. And what it, the analogy I used in that video was feeling it kind of like last March of 2023, when Pluto first moved in, it moved into Aquarius for what, a couple of months. And then it moved back into Capricorn and it's been in Cap back in Capricorn for the last six-ish months. And now it's going to be in Aquarius from January 20th to September 1st. So we're getting a longer time with Aquarius. Um, yeah, with Pluto and Aquarius, but then it moves, it dips itself back into Capricorn just for two and a half months in next fall. And then it really moves into Aquarius next in November of 2024. So the analogy I used was like, it, it's almost like to me, like, um, like there's a pond and we dipped our self in a little bit into the water of Aquarius and um, maybe we waded into our calves or something and then we walked back onto the land of Capricorn and then now we're about to maybe submerge ourselves into the water and doggy paddle or something <laughs> but then we're going to go back onto the land for a couple months and then we're really going to swim right so it's like we get to test it out and this this moment right now before we you know, take our second dive into Aquarius feels like, like, like I was saying in that video, it, I think um, 
we have this idea. I know I've talked about this, this, I think, with both of you. We have this idea that Saturn bad, Capricorn bad. <laughs> we want to get away from that stuff. But we don't really. <laughs> and it's not bad. <laughs> we just need to change our perspective, right? It's actually beautiful. And it's actually our deep, ancient wisdom. It's not a thing to get rid of. <laughs> We would be very sad without Saturn and without Capricorn. So it's really about, to me, about coming into, um, okay, what what can I, what what am I ready to let go of for sure? But also, what is it in that deep wisdom and in my ancient history, even my relationships to my ancestry, like the essence of my deep ancestry that I want to bring with me? And how do I want to enter Aquarius in a new way? I tried it out a little bit. I tested the waters last year. Now we get to tr try it on again, but we get to do it in a new way, right? And then we get to take a step back again. And then the end of this year, we'll really do it. But any thoughts? That's amazing. Okay, so I have a couple of thoughts. Yes. Yeah. All right, so this gate, the solar plexus gate with Venus and, and the moon having been with Antares, the heart of the dragon, we're just going to focus on dragon for the moment because we're going into the Chinese year of the dragon at the new moon in February. And I've, I've been doing several videos all about unleashing your inner dragon, connecting with the dragon energy so that uh, we can, because it's been off our, um, field of awareness in a lot of ways, like they are just mythical creatures. There's just these great stories about them, but people don't necessarily recognize that I, they, there's probably way more to them than we realize and that we can, and that they live inside this energy lives inside of us. In fact, in ancient cultures, they talked about the dragon lines of the earth where there were um, power lines where they would connect and cross and they build temples or they build sacred sites on these dragon lines. And, uh, but, the, but the dragons haven't really, they've been, it's what the, uh, the knights of the, <laughs> of the round table or different stories would go out and slay the dragon and save the princess. But the dragon being maybe perhaps feminine energy. And so uh, they they really are, it's really time for us to have a greater awareness. And as I've been talking about this, so many people are telling me stories about how they're having encounters with dragons, just like you were sharing, Martha, about your, yeah. So, so we have this Venus gate opening the door to this year of the dragon coming up. It's like amazing. <laughs> and I think when we're in our um, healthy, vibrant life force energy within our own bodies, the meridians and the ley lines in our bodies, the dragon lines in our bodies, it's like, how are we bringing that energy forth in the best ways possible and recognizing where maybe we have beliefs, we have uh, limiting things that are, are happening for us and that now we have an opportunity to unleash the dragon energy within us in ways that haven't ever maybe been possible for eons of time and this and now is the time so that's that's what i'm thinking can i add in something yes <laughs> <laughs> this is oh wow see this is part of why i am studying with both of you because this is what keeps happening as i'm listening to all the things i'm listening to in your courses i get these uh, epiphanies like it just clicked <laughs> <laughs> like, how did I not know this? So, okay, you just added in a component to something I've already been feeling, but it, this is just adding in yet another beautiful layer. <laughs> it's like fascinating. Okay, so the one of the biggest overarching themes that I have been getting shown and told by the spirit world for 2024 is this opportunity, what they say, they're so adamant <laughs> that we have this opportunity in this year um, to, to be coming into our ultimate divine blueprint on an energetic level. And what they show me over and over and over again is it's like, as though our energy being in our energy being, it's like, we are, we have, um, like wires, right? Like, like lines, like, well, we have the meridians, we have, but we have energy wires in our being. And what they show me is that it's, it's not a perfect analogy, but 
it's as though those wires are have been like dormant Legos. <laughs> so so it's like all the the building blocks have always been there, but it's in this year for whatever reason um, that a lot of us will be held in a way so that we can both be unhooking and letting go of those previous structures that don't serve, right? That maybe that part of that Capricorn energy that we're ready to let go of. But then as we're moving into, um, I think, I think it's Pluto and Aquarius. I think it's the Jupiter Uranus conjunction. I think it's also Chiron on the North node, but now you're adding in this dragon energy, the dragon lines thing is adding in a whole other layer. It's that what they show me is that this year is holding space for those essentially, you know, Lego blocks, of the but the the energy lines to come actually into the formation that they're ultimately meant to be in as us. Yeah. So it's like they've like if they're Legos, they've been all of the Legos have been present our whole lives, our whole existence. But they've just been lying there dormant and they're actually meant to be whatever, like a castle or like a, I don't know, an Elsa something, <laughs> whatever it is. And, and so now this is in this year, we're getting held in so many ways. I think probably even beyond what I can conceive, or maybe we can conceive of with our intellectual mind, basically for the divine to hold space for the, the Legos to, to manifest into that structure of the, whatever the castle, the whatever, and actually become that ultimate divine blueprint that is us energetically. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. How, wow. Yeah. And how like uh, perfect that you're talking about this as like the Capricorn and Aquarius are happening together, right? Because that's what I'm hearing a lot in what you're saying, right? The yes. ley lines, the Capricorn, the Aquarius kind of piece, the energetics, the, the, you know, chakra lines, the nervous system lines, right? And then the Capricorn piece of like the structure and like building that so that it, it does all come back into alignment, right? And just like you said, like, you know, people look at like Saturn and Capricorn is like, oh, bad or boring. And Aquarius is, oh my gosh. But it's like, we need them both, right? It's like, if we want to step into that exalted side of Aquarius, it's like humanity, egalitarian ideals, right? We need to come all together into community and let go of those structures that have kept us separate and apart from each other because Capricorn wants us to come into community and egalitarian ideals as well because that's what makes the world sustainable for us, right? So it's like, I love that of like, how the Capricorn mysteries are informing the Aquarian mysteries and vice versa, right? Because we need it all. And gosh, isn't it time for us to like all come into one human community together where I'm not better or less than you and all of us rise together when we're together, right? The ultimate Aquarian perspective. So yay <laughs> and held by the saturn like aquarian but held yes. by yes <laughs> yeah yeah totally embodied just, right yes. yeah coming into the earth and not just in the mind and out and spinning around yeah well they they work together because if you you have the great idea you need to have the ability to put that idea into form capricorn exactly. can put it into form aquarius can have that expanded vision and then, then it can actually become manifest in this reality. So they work together when they're in their healthy expression, not their shadow side. <laughs> yeah, actually, I just made a video yesterday where I was talking about this and, and people were like a little confused because people are so upset by Saturn and so upset by Capricorn. I think it took a few people a little moment to be like, wait, really? <laughs> but, the, but the analogy I used yesterday was like, like maybe, you know, you could think of Uranus Aquarian energy being like the, the visionary architect, right? And then Saturn, you, but, but if you only have the vision and the blueprint, you're just going to be sort of an idea. <laughs> We're here on the earth. And so we need that Saturn Capricorn to actually be present with the vision and work, you know, infused with the vision. And we need to hold space. We need to hold that Saturn reality very, very lightly and give it the freedom and the space to breathe, to, you know, to change on a very subtle level, moment by moment by moment by moment. So it's not just stuck. 
Um, but that's the Uranus infusing the Saturn energy. Yeah. And if we think about how patriarchy has created a way for us to see reality and to experience reality and that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we're not enough, we've got to prove ourselves and we need to work really hard to do that, which is not the essence of Capricorn. Mm -hmm. Capricorn is like, how do we do it in the most effective, efficient way to get the best results? And so we don't have to work so hard, <laughs> but that's been the patriarchal or dominator culture uh, overlay on Saturn and Capricorn. So our opportunity, and I think with um, the, the Aquarian energies coming in so strong with Pluto moving into Aquarius is how do we get free from that? And then be able to see uh, there were cultures that could work 15 hours a month to provide for all their needs. The rest of the time was creative, ceremonial, um, community, having, you know, interaction and fun and play, because that's the essence of Capricorn, not the hard work. And it's difficult and you're not smart enough or good enough or uh, enough in any way and whatever that's about. It's just, that's how we've been trained. And so we're letting go of that old perspective. So we can move mm -hmm. into a time where we can have way more fun <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and do it in a way that all our needs are met and everything is sustainable in the process. So, oh, that and I think you bring up like such an amazing point of if it's got this patriarchal overlay and there's a big emphasis on like traditional astrology, which is a lot of where that came through, which was a very patriarchal culture. It's like, how do we start to feel into what Saturn really is for us individually now? And like go outside, look at Saturn. Do you go outside and you look at Saturn in the evening sky right now and you go, oh my gosh, ew, ow, oh no. You know, you go, oh my gosh, wow, look, it's like beautiful, right? Like open your heart to that and feel that. And like, there's nothing like negative there, right? The moon is going to come up to Saturn soon. So it's an easy way to spot Saturn in the evening sky. Like just after sunset, the moon will be with Saturn. I could look and see the dates, but it's coming up soon. And, and um, like, just be with it, right? You don't have to feel anything. You don't have to get anything. You don't have to anything. Just be with it and just see what like you feel, what comes to you, right? Develop a living relationship with these planets, with the sky, and that'll take like the fear and that overlay will go away because you cannot go out and see Saturn in the sky and feel anything other than just like love and abundance and beauty and joy, right? I, I got to see Saturn through a telescope for the first time in November and I was astounded. <laughs> it really does have rings. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crystal clear <laughs> and it's so easy to see through a telescope i mean really it's, it's right there um yeah it's so so beautiful and actually that that maybe brings me to at least for me the last layer that i would love to drop in before we close but i'm also open to anything <laughs> either of you want to say is um i've been thinking of both of you of course so much of the last few months as i begin to my relationship to the cosmos has gone from being more of, you know, what the way I was taught was more of a two dimensional relationship. And through working with you and through working with Heather Ensworth last year and through other things I'm doing, it's like, it's like the whole world, the, the, not only the three dimensional experience of astrology, but the infinite, infinite, dimen <laughs> in, infinite dimensional experience experience of astrology is coming alive it's like you know just opening up so um so for example for me one of the things that was happening really strongly in october and november and even now when i go on walks at night is the experience of jupiter right like in so in i think it was october november jupiter was rising right as the sun was setting so and i'd go on a lot of sunset walks and Jupiter almost every night was right there rising as I was finishing my walk. And so I would be feeling this, right? And I would be feeling into, okay, so in the way I was taught astrology, again, it's more of a two-dimensional experience. And so we'll look at a chart and we'll see the glyph of the sun over here. And we'll see the glyph of Jupiter over here. And there's a very intellectual 
um, description of what the sun opposite Jupiter means, quote unquote, right? And so we we look at the chart and interpret it through that very more intellect, uh, intellectualized way of thinking of it. But when I'm out there, actually in the outside, <laughs> and I am seeing the sun having just set over here, and I'm feeling the presence of that gorgeous sunset, and then I'm feeling the presence of this being, Jupiter, rising over here. To me, it's like Jupiter suddenly was holding space for the, all, the whole evening sky. That's how I personally was feeling it. And I was thinking, wow, when we look at that two-dimensional chart, it doesn't even, nothing, none of this is alive in that, right? So I would... I would love to, you both have so much more, <laughs> so much more experience than I do with that reality and that personalized experience. Um, I don't know if there's something you each would want to say about any of that. Feel free. <laughs> Sheridan? I would just say, just go and be outside with it, right? It doesn't, so there can be kind of a pressure, like, you don't have to get all the meaning. You don't have to have like a channeled message. You don't have to, you know what I mean? It's just, just go and be present with it. That's what our ancestors were doing. And you could do that for years. And that, that is your ceremony, right? That is the ceremony is being present. You don't even have to know where everything is, but there's a ton of apps you could get to look and figure that out. But if just over time, like the way I started doing it was I just slept in my yard in the summers because you wake up when you roll over and you're like whoa look how far the moon has moved and like oh my gosh and then you know if you start to develop this relationship and this connection to how the earth is turning and what that means for you and, and a visceral feeling and that's the only place I think you need to start with it is just be with the beauty of it. And it like connects you into your ancestral DNA, right? It connects you into your divineness, your divine expression, connection, your soul being with the earth and the sky. And like, that's a win, right? That's a huge step forward in like all of our spiritual development. I love that so much. And, and the thing that I have found is that at over time, some there'll be, you'll get downloads, you'll get insights and information because you have that relationship and it can happen sooner for some people than other people. But the more that you are engaging that, the more you're going to experience that. And then it becomes really alive for you. And it's not just something somebody told you, but it's something you're experiencing directly. And uh, just, a, just a thought to, to kind of wrap up as we're um, uh, looking at um, Pluto going into Aquarius, the seasonal sign of Aquarius. And a couple of years ago, Saturn was in the seasonal sign of Aquarius. Well, last year it went into Pisces. Um, so for a couple of years before that, it was in Aquarius. And it was moving through a constellation called the goatfish or Capricornus, also known as Capricorn, but it's a, it's overlaid by the season of Aquarius. And so watching Saturn move through that constellation. And what's interesting is we just, because we were just talking about how Aquarius and Capricorn can work together. So that, that constellation was overlaid by the season of Capricorn, meaning the December solstice was rising in that constellation, uh, probably around uh 2100 well more than 2160 years ago but now it's rising on the galactic cross letting us know that we're at the turning of a great the great wheel of time moving into a 26000 year cycle and so the um so pluto is right on the edge and getting ready to move into that constellation we won't mm -hmm. see pluto but if you're if you can see that constellation you have to be under a dark sky but the whole thing that we just shared about Aquarius and Capricorn is literally showing up in the sky because the constellations inform the seasonal signs. They have energy. The constellations have their own energy. The seasonal signs have their own energy. And over 26,000 years, every seasonal sign will be with every constellation. And so this bringing together Aquarius and Capricorn 
or the energy of that constellation, also known as the sea goat or the goatfish or Capricornus, or it looks a little, little bit like a boomerang in the sky. Um, it, it's helping to inform us. And even though we can't see Pluto there, we can tune into it. And Pluto will be going through that constellation for about 20 years. So mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just how we take these different layers of understanding and recognize that there's an evolution constantly taking place. And as we attune to that, we can attune to that evolution that's happening and get our own insights, our own um, inspiration, maybe our own uh, direction from the sky itself. Yeah, and you, <clears throat> Kaylin, you have, well, okay, so I've been, one of the courses I've been taking with you and Eric Roth is your zodiacal constellations course, which actually explains in detail the, the connect or the uh, relationship between the zodiac, zi, zodo, the zodiacal um, seasonal <laughs> sign and the zodiacal constellation and how they, how we can infuse them and have a relationship with both of them at the same time. Anyway, and, and I highly recommend that course. I love it. Um, I've gone through it. I'm going to be going through it probably many, many times. <laughs> so much information in there. But you also have a free video, which I've shared with my all of my students because it's amazing. And it's a, it's a very simplified yet very dense and um, highly informative video on the difference between, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, the difference between the zodiac, uh, the seasonal signs and the constellations, right? Um, it has a lot of views, many, many, many views because yes. it's amazing. It's a, it's a 15 minute video and I, I'll put it in my show notes. And if you want to put it yeah. in your show notes, that'll be it great. Will, yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a 15 minute, like lots of visuals of why this is happening and how it's happening now. So yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that video and I probably will watch it many times myself. <laughs> yeah. Great. Beautiful. Um, and I want to throw in one other thing about both of you that I appreciate so much. And then I think actually speaks to this Saturn, Uranus, Capricorn, Aquarius dance and like the meeting of the two uh, is Another thing I really highly value myself and I appreciate about both of you so much <laughs> is that when you are holding space for, for people in general, when you're holding space for our relationship with the cosmos and with astrology, you, you do it in a way that gives space for people to be themselves, right? And to have their own way of being with these things. So something that my Venus and Aries really needs <laughs> and I have a pretty strong Uranus in my own chart um I need that space to do it my way and and I feel that with both of you so strongly and that's that's not something I take for granted at all <laughs> so I just want to name that that's you know I really 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 personally appreciate that and I'm glad you. Grateful you hold that in it's great to get that reflection back because that is of course our intent <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, and I feel like working, yay. <laughs> what'd you say? I said it's good that it's working, yay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I feel like it, it's always important, but I think even as we're moving forward, to me, it's extra, 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 extra important that that we're both held in a grounded way that honors, you know, tradition and honors structures that have come before, and yet gives us that space to really be bring it into aliveness in our own self <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah thank you martha for inviting us to join you this has been really fun <laughs> thank you. yeah thank you so much it's so awesome just to talk with both of you and we love it thank you i love it too we'll do it again yes definitely <laughs> um so where can people find you and what is what can people join you for um what's available uh venusalchemy.com and that pretty much tells you everything that we're doing right now if people want to join in on the venus cycle that's currently happening you can still do that uh, we'll be we'll be completing the morning star and then starting the evening star in july I think we complete in April and start in July or something like that. So, anyway, and uh, uh, yeah, um, that's probably the best best way to find us. Awesome. And you both, 
you both do readings, also personal readings, and um, and Kaylin, you also have the Star Alchemy. Yeah. So if you go to mystaralchemy.com, you can find the classes. We're in the middle of doing a class right now. You can join if you want. Uh, you can wait till we're done and jump in then. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so and it's it's on uh, our ancestral origins and our divine destiny, looking at two stellar gateways that um, how we can tune into that. And yeah, it's been pretty amazing. I've been being blown away myself. <laughs> so I learn more things myself. So yeah. yeah. And the two courses I'm doing through Star, Star Alchemy with you actually are the two that you've already that are already recorded and out there. So that's also a possibility if people feel called. Um, yeah, yeah. So the, the magical stars of the ancient alchemists, also known as the Bahinian stars. And there's 15 of them. And then there's the zodiacal constellations and how their, um, what their, what their background is, but also how they're being overlaid by different signs now. So they're not the same. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, and anyway, learning about all of that is absolutely changing my perspective on so many things. <laughs> and that is a, another many hours conversation. So for another yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for another time. Wonderful. And um, people who don't know me, I'm at living the one light dot com. Yeah. Wonderful. And Jordan, you're oh, oh, yeah. I'm just my name, Sheridan Simple.com. And um depending upon when you listen to this, I am doing a free new moon ceremony tomorrow, but I do an online new moon ceremony every month that you can always jump in. And we learn about the current astrology and then like set our intentions and um but it's free tomorrow if you happen to listen to this soon and we're going to do new year, new moon intentions and um, setting our course for the year to come. Beautiful. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to everybody listening. So please share with us anything you would like to share. <laughs>